Hello, Nupik. Uh, this is Matt Taylor. I am Numenta's open source community flag bearer, and I am here to show you how to use the HTM engine, which is a, a tool or piece of code that we open sourced a month or so ago, and it makes it really nice and easy to create a bunch of Nupik anomaly models all at one time and have them running all at once and feeding data into them at once. So this is kind of a, as opposed to the hot gem uh, tutorial where we're just really creating one model and uh, doing prediction, we're going to create over a hundred models in this uh, tutorial. And I'm going to show you how to do it using HTM engine. And we're going to run them all at once and get anomaly indications out of them. So without further ado, First, I'm going to introduce you to the HTM engine architecture. Uh, if you look here, uh, basically, it can, HTM engine uh, has a few services. Um, it must have MySQL and RabbitMQ installed. These are used internally to keep track of all of the different models that it creates um, and queuing data that will be input into those models. Um, but we don't need to really know about this. Uh, we can take a look if you would like. Um, at the Nementa apps repo here. This is where this code base exists. And uh, if you look right here, here is the HTM engine repo. That's what I am talking about. Uh, that's what we're gonna be doing today. Uh, it's really sort of a standalone tool. It, it does use a, some utilities in here, which we'll install as well. Uh, but we will get to that in a minute. Um, but that's what the HTM engine architecture looks like. There is a really nice scaffolding um, provided by my friend and co-worker Austin Marshall called the Skeleton HTM Engine app. This is what I use to create this application and it makes it really easy uh, to create an app uh, because HTM Engine, all it really needs to run is a bunch of configuration. So what he created was uh, all the configuration uh, with everything, you know, a lot of default values and stuff in there. Um, and which is a configuration scaffold. And so you have to go in and change some of those values to uh, make it work for you in your environment, but it's really easy to do. Um, and this skeleton app also contains this nice HTTP API. So I can write my application in whatever programming environment I want and communicate with the HTM engine over HTTP. So this is nice because I don't have to write my app in Python and import all the HTM engine stuff. I don't have to go to MySQL or RabbitMQ. We just let that little HTTP interface take care of that. So that's what we're gonna do in this application. And let me give you a quick overview of the full architecture of what I'm gonna show you today. So over on the left here in the green Python box, you can see basically what I just showed you, HTM engine and the skeleton stuff around it, the, the configuration and the HTTP API. Um, and what I've created is a client to that HTM engine that's all written in JavaScript that gathers traffic information uh, from a service on the internet uh, and pushes a information about New York City traffic in real time uh, as we're getting it from the New York DOT uh, and pushes those values into uh, the HTM engine so that it can generate models around all these different paths of and traffic speeds in New York City. Um, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about when, when I get to that. Um, but for now, let's go to this repository when I'm talking about HTM traffic tutorial. That's what I'm gonna be walking through today with you. And there is a, a readme here with all of these nice installation instructions. So uh, there's really three parts to this, as I've already explained. There's the Python server that runs HTM engine, runs those services, and has the HTTP API. And there is a Node.js client application, which is the JavaScript runtime, and the Riverview data service. I'm not gonna to talk too much about this, but that's this red diamond here. That's where the data is coming from. This is just raw speed data for 153 different traffic paths in New York City. So, like I said, that's the architecture. Um, if you want to build your own application the same way I built this one, get, do it off of that skeleton HTTP application. That's, a, that's the, the best place to start. It's really easy to get going there. Uh, okay, so uh, requirements. Let's get this thing installed and, uh, and get going. 
Uh, the HTM engine, we're going to install that. It needs NTA utils, which we'll do. Supervisor, which is a service controller. Um, MySQL, RabbitMQ, which is a message queuing system, and our client's going to need Node.js. Um, you also need a Google Maps API key if you want to do all, if you want to see all the maps and stuff. Um, it's really, it's free, easy to get, uh, but you have to go to Google to get it. Um, okay, so starting it up. Uh, first of all, we need to start the HTM engine and install it. So we're going to move over to that readme, which is in the Python folder. It's got its own readme. Install and start required services. So I'm going to need MySQL, RabbitMQ, and Supervisor. So I'm not going to go through how to install MySQL or RabbitMQ or Supervisor because it's different on every system. You're going to have to figure that out yourself. Um, but I am going to start uh, my MySQL server. There we go. So I, you must have MySQL running, and there it is. I should be able to say MySQL and uh, log in. There we go. Show databases. Very good. OK. Uh, RabbitMQ also needs to be started. RabbitMQ server, I think. And we're going to do that in the background. OK. There we go. And uh, I, I want to show you also MQ admin that uh, if we list all the queues, there's nothing in RabbitMQ right now. It's totally empty. Um, so there we've got RabbitMQ running. And Supervisor, I have installed, um, but I'm not going to start it right now. But you will have to install Supervisor. Um, just go to, you can click this link, go to the website, and, and figure out how to get it running on your system. It's just a nice um, service manager, process manager type of software. You'll see it in action in a minute. OK, number two, install HTM engine and NTA utils. So uh, this assumes, well, you must have Numenta apps checked out somewhere locally because we're going to be running off of that code base. So I have that installed at NTA Numenta apps. And we'll go into HTM engine and run Python setup develop user. And this will install all of the Python modules that HTM engine needs to run. And we'll also go down into NTA utils, which is a sibling directory, NTA utils, and run the exact same command. Python setup develop dash dash user, if you like. Uh, that's up to you. OK, so we have the Python modules necessary for HTM engine and the utilities to run. Uh, now, installed required Python modules for HTM engine traffic tutorial itself, not its dependencies. So we'll be going back to where I have HTM uh, traffic tutorial, uh, that repository checked out. And uh, it says I need to run this command, pip install dash r and those requirements. So this basically just installs all of the Python modules that HTM engine traffic tutorial needs. And that's for the Python server part of it. OK. We also need to export an environment variable. This is for HTM engine. It needs to know where the application configuration is. In our case, it's in Python engine conf. And we'll be talking about changing some of the values in, in these files in a moment. But for right now, uh, we're just going to export this application config path. Here we go. Uh, to point to the conf directory in Python engine. Uh, all right. So next step, create a MySQL database. So we're going to create one called traffic. Should be able to just do this from the command line. Now we should have. MySQL database. I'll just trust that it's there. Didn't get any errors. Apply database migrations. Okay, so we have an empty database, but it doesn't have a schema yet. So running this command will create the appropriate schema that this that HTM engine needs to uh, store all the data it needs to store. So let's take a look now. Uh, root. And we should use traffic. That database should be there. Show tables. And we have a schema. Uh, I'm not going to go over all this, but you, you can look into it if you want to. Uh, this is what HTM Engine uses uh, to run. But we don't need to look at it right now. 
we have applied the database migrations and now we, there are two configuration files in that conf directory I was telling you about that need to be changed. Um, okay, so I will open up an editor here and we will go into those files. The first one it says is in Python engine comp supervisor, Python engine comp supervisor, and look for anywhere it says users M Taylor NTA, because that's me. Um, look for that and there's two results. There's one for the environment and that points to a conf directory. You need to replace this with wherever, whatever path you have to your checkout to HTM engine traffic tutorial in this location and also at the bottom in this location under include files. So update those two values in supervisord.conf and also in the model checkpoint.conf, which is a sibling file, there's storage root. This is where HTM engine saves model checkpoint. So where it serializes models to disk. You can put this wherever you want, just uh, put it, point it to a location on your file system. Um, and uh, if it doesn't exist, I believe it will go ahead and create it. So uh, update that. Uh, those are the, the only two places in your config files that you'll need to change, as far as I know. And now we can start our services with Supervisor. Uh, when we run this, this is going to start those services that we saw up here, the anomaly service, the metric listener, the metric store, and the model scheduler. So let's do that. We want to be in Python engine, make a logs directory in case that we don't already have one. So Python engine, there is already a logs directory. Uh, and we're going to say supervisor D dash C for config. And here's the path to the config file that you should have just updated uh, with the right paths. And this will start supervisor. Now you can look uh, supervisor CTL status will show you that those four services that we just talked about are running. You may also go to localhost 9001 to see the web view of these services. But that's unnecessary, but it's an easy way to look at the logs if you feel like looking at some logs. Uh, so supervisor is running, HTM engine is running right now. Uh, interesting thing, if we look at our rabbit queues, we have a few queues in there. So when HTM engine started its services, it created some queues in Rabbit so it could start communicating with uh, itself. Uh, okay, so we have services started. Um, we've checked the status, Everything go everything's good. We can stop all those services by running this command. Let's go back to the readme and continue from where we left off. Now we've, we need to uh, start the HTTP server, all right? We said there was a, this little shim uh, HTTP interface that needs to be started all on its own. Um, so we've, uh, we've taken care of the scaffold, we've started all the HTML engine services, let's start this little server. It's uh, very easy to start, we're in Python engine, so we just say Python web app. And there we go. So this little server uh, is gonna run for the duration of the demo here. So I'm just gonna move this guy over, put him over to the side here, and uh, we'll start seeing it doing things soon. Uh, but right now, all, all it is is a stateless HTTP server that's just passing commands back and, uh, from, from my client application, it's not running yet, into HTM engine. Okay, so we've got that started. That runs on localhost 8080. Now we need to go to the JavaScript side and start the HTM client. So that stuff, uh, back to the traffic tutorial directory, is in this node client directory. So we'll go into node client. Um, this is where our node app is. And to install its dependencies, we run npm install uh, dot, which tells it install this directory. And this will install all of the node packages that need to be there uh, for it to run. Similarly, to what we did when we did a pip install requirements um, in the Python world. Okay, so uh, all that stuff is now installed. We should be able to say npm start at this point and watch stuff happen. Let's do it, npm start.
And there we go. So what's going on here? You can see our HTTP uh, shim is uh, plugging away. It's getting a bunch of requests right now from the client application. I am also gonna show you my CPU usage because it's gonna spike like crazy here uh, when, as this thing starts up. Um, here we go. We'll just don't, we'll just put this over here so we can see what's going on with our CPU. So um, let me come back to this diagram and try and give you an indication of what's actually going on here. Uh, let's get this out of the way. So when this guy starts up, uh, what it's gonna do is it uses this traffic pusher component of the client application, goes to this traffic data service. That, and asks how many different traffic paths are there. It gets all of the different IDs for those traffic paths and it pushes the model IDs for those routes into through the HTTP API to the HTM engine and says create a model. So it creates one model for every single one of these traffic routes that it gets from the data service. Um, I should probably show you what this data service actually looks like here. So let's do that. Um, the data is coming from a service we're running called Riverview. Uh, there's NYC traffic here, and this contains really uh, in at least 10 minutes uh, intervals uh, data for all these different traffic paths. Uh, so each one of these rows here is a different traffic path that the New York City DOT makes available. For example, here's traffic route 444. Um, if we look at the metadata, we will see that this is in Manhattan. It's from West Street South Battery Place to FDR North Catherine Slip, whatever that means. And we actually have coordinates for it. And uh, we'll see these routes plotted on the map soon enough, but I just want to show you where the data is coming from. If we look at the data, um, you can see uh, we've got two values here, uh, speed and travel time. Uh, our app is only gonna use speed, and I assume that over the entire path of this traffic route, this is the average speed from whatever sensors the DOT has installed there um, for the past 10 minutes or so. Um, so that's what we're gonna use. Uh, so this comes in a HTML form if you wanna view it, but you can also, uh, and what the client application is doing is getting it in JSON form. So as you can see, this is what the JSON looks like. It tells you this is speed and travel time. And here's the data for each timestamp. Here's your speed, here's your travel time. And there's a bunch of data points, okay? So that's the traffic service that we're getting our data from. Uh, back to here. Uh, and like I said, for each one of those 153 routes, a model is created. And then it goes and gets all the traffic history, speed for that traffic, uh, for that route, and pushes it for, for each model in serial, uh, every different value. So uh, right now, what, why, this, why our CPUs are totally pegged now is because uh, HTM Engine has 153 NuPic models running and a bunch of data queued for each one, and it's pushing a piece of data into each model uh, over and over and over and over, and um, it's struggling to catch up with the amount of data I'm pushing to it. So uh, if we look at the output for our client application, or it's saying, okay, so for this path, I am posted. I just posted uh, data to HTM Engine. I've got 139 more models to go, 130 or 127 more models to go. Um, so it's keeping track of uh, where it is in the queue. And as you can see, there's a lot of data points being pushed. This guy's got almost 3,000. This guy's got 200 or 755, et cetera. Um, and we're just gonna have to sit and wait uh, while this catches up. Um, and you can see all the data posts that are happening over here. Um, the thing is the client application is gonna push data to HTM Engine faster than it can keep up. So even after we've gotten through all of these different models, you see we've got 123 more to go, uh, the engine has still got a whole bunch of data in its queue, in its queues for its models that it's gonna still have to process. So um, that it's gonna take a while. Uh, I think last time I did it, it took me about half an hour. Um, but the nice thing is you can kill this. 
So here we go. I just killed the client application. Um, as you can see from my CPU usage, um, I'm still pegged. My CPUs are still running because HTM engine is still running. Uh, the HTTP API is still running. I just turned my client off. I basically stopped pushing data. Um, and you can just restart it. And what it will do is go to the HTM engine, ask how much, what was the last data point you got for all these different models and start pulling or start pulling more data from the traffic service from that timestamp. So you can start and stop this even if it's not through posting data to the HTM engine and it will just proceed where it left off. And there we go, we're already back to 119 more models to go. And at this point, um, it's probably a good place to uh, mention that if you don't wanna sit here and wait for half an hour or so, depending on your system, I've got eight cores, you might have four, it's gonna take twice as long. If you don't wanna sit here and wait, there's a way you can speed this up. So let me show you real quick how to speed this up. In, uh, let's close our config files here. Uh, in the node client, there's a conf directory and there's a config module. Down at the bottom, it says path whitelist. Currently it's undefined. Uh, that means it's going to load every single traffic path, but you can specify individuals. So if I just put 442, uh, that for example, this is a um, data path 442. Uh, it's only gonna load this one traffic path and not all 153 of them that are that that are available. So you can kind of hand pick in here uh, which ones you want to load and just uh, tell it specifically what is the whitelist. I could put 442, 1, 34, whatever. Uh, and then it'll take a whole lot less time for it to stand up because um, it's only got one path or a handful of paths instead of 153. So uh, that's just in case you want it to run faster. I'm gonna sit here and let it run and run and run uh, so that we can uh, like get the whole data experience. So uh, I'm gonna pause the recording right now and I will be back as soon as uh, HTM engine is caught up, all the data has been posted and we'll take a look at what kind of traffic anomalies we can find. So, okay, we're back and uh, looks like HTM engine just caught up and the client has said it's gonna be polling at 10 minute intervals. Um, so what that means is after 10 minutes, it's gonna go back to HTM engine, ask it, um, what was the last time you saw data for each one of these paths? Take that timestamp and go to the data service and ask for any new points of data that occurred after those timestamps and push those new points into HTM engine. So at 10 minute intervals, you're going to see your CPU usage spike yet again, but for a limited period of time while well, it just processes whatever occurred in the past 10 minutes. Um, so, but now we can go to the web app. Uh, with all of the stuff going on on this console, you might have missed that uh, web application started at some point here uh, while it was creating models and all that jazz. Here it is. Uh, so it's a, it's running on localhost 8083. And here is the HTM engine traffic tutorial. Uh, there we go. Make this a little bit easier to see here. Um, so this is the app. Now it's got all of the data within it. So let me do, give you a little bit of walkthrough of what's what's going on here. Let's first look at the route index. Well, let's look at, let's look at the map first. So you can see all these routes mapped. Here are the routes that we pulled data for. Um, they all have these little icons by them that show you this is 153, where it's at, and then links to some charts and stuff. Uh, but uh, let me take the route markers off. You can see I've just colored them randomly so you can sort of see where they're at. And then the route markers are at the first point in the route if we wanna see it. Uh, so that there's where all the routes are. And you can see there's lots of gaps. This is, I mean, there's so much traffic in this area. I wish I could have gotten a lot more data, but uh, we're, we're gonna try and dig in and see if we can associate some traffic anomalies with some actual traffic accidents and we're gonna find out that a lot of accidents occurred so far away from any of these routes, there's nothing we can do about them. Okay, so that's 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 the map of all the routes that we have. Let's also look at uh, the route index. So this is a view of every one of these routes and you can um, 
you know, it identifies what borough. I think you can sort. Yeah, so you can sort up here if you want to uh, sort on address or ID or borough, etc. I'm going to sort on ID. And then each one of these routes has um, a chart. I'm going to go to 442 because I know that's an interesting route and it, all, it has a lot of data. It's at the very tip of Manhattan, southern tip. So uh, let's look at these routes, this route. This route, um, it looks like we've got one, two, three, four, over four weeks of data for. Uh, the yellow things on this chart here are weekends and we can kind of drill into this chart and see, this is from you know August 2nd here, August 3rd, midnight. And uh, so that was Sunday and this is Monday morning and rush hour. And if you wanna look, dive into rush hour and you can see how anomalous the traffic speed is over time. So it looks like, uh, for example, at 4.07, traffic was very slow. It was going from you know, 16 miles per hour there, jumped all the way down to three miles per hour, and then a big jump to 30 miles per hour just 10 minutes later. So that caused the anomaly likelihood to go up quite a bit. Uh, so that's just an idea of one route. Um, when you're looking at one traffic route, you've got some options over here. You can view it on the map. You can view the daily charts, which is interesting. So if we go to daily charts, this will map out um, 24 hour period. So the first one is the 24 hour period starting now going backwards 24 hours. And then each consecutive chart underneath it is the previous 24 hour period. And you can see there's big gaps in data. Uh, this is pretty typical for this traffic data set. Um, but you can also see that, uh, you know, for example, this route has a lot of anomalous activity occurring around rush hour, which makes sense because just things are going to be generally more chaotic during rush hour period. Uh, so let's go back home. I also want to show you, you can, you can look at the boroughs directly if you want to see a map of just the Manhattan routes. There they are. If you want to see charts of just the Manhattan charts, here they are. Um, and you, we can actually, uh, once these charts load, we, we can actually grab one chart and it will res resize all the other charts, rescale them uh, to be that time period. So this is from uh, midnight Sunday to right now. And then I can go through and click this hide button to, uh, I guess it's not working. There it goes. I click the hide button to hide the routes that don't have any interesting things going on. This is this is typically what I do to try and do some like analysis on uh, what traffic anomalies are happening in what areas. So I'm just going to I'm just going through and hiding all of these. Uh, da, 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 da. Hide, hide, hide. Of course, this, this could be made better because it keeps popping up to the top and I'm not too worried about it. Anyway, there's a lot of routes in Manhattan. And uh, as you, you can scan through time periods and see, okay, 10 o'clock, something crazy happened on this route, Route 1. Um, at the same time, a similar time, something interesting was happening on this route, Route 122. Uh, so this is one way to peruse the traffic data and try and look and see what's going on. Um, perhaps a more efficient way is to search for traffic anomalies. Uh, let's close this so I can show you this full screen. Okay, so... Um, let's say I want to get all traffic anomalies for like from rush hour, let's say it starts maybe 4.22 uh, up until now, New York time. And we want any anomalies that are over 0.99. Click this button, wait a few seconds, and we'll get all of the routes through in all of the boroughs uh, that had uh, data points over that threshold of 0.99. And so there's two options here. Click here to plot them. This will bring up a new screen where you can see during that time period what each of these routes look like, what their anomaly scores look like. Um, so this is a good way to try and identify anomalies. Uh, for example, it looks like something is occurring around 10 o'clock here. So let's hide in all of these different guys that didn't have like a, a bump up at that time period. Hide you, hide you, hide you. Yeah, it's a little bit of a bump. We'll leave him. Uh, hide you, hide you. No, no. <laughs> hide. 
anyway, I'm just trying to get rid of all of the routes that, that like don't have some type of anomaly increase at this time period. This is, this is another way you can try and identify uh, traffic anomalies. Um, so uh, these are all, so two Manhattan, two Queens, and another Manhattan. Uh, so this is another way you might be able to identify something. Some, something strange is happening between 10 and 11 on several of these routes. So this is a big, a big this is why this anomaly score is high, because it jumped from 54 miles per hour down to 1, and then back up to 55 10 minutes later. That's probably just a bad data, but definitely anomalous. Um, and in the others, uh, so maybe you don't know, like Route 122, whether this is, uh, like, maybe we want to see the history of this. So I'm going to click on the daily routes for Route 122. And then we can see, ah, uh, so I don't really trust the, this anomaly because we haven't seen a whole lot of data, right? There's a, the data points in the past are really few and far between. And it just got enough so the anomaly likelihood started giving decent values here. So I'm not really going to trust that one. Um, let's look at another one, 315 in Queens. This one is similar. It's, uh, it's only been getting anomaly likelihoods for the past day. Having a lot of data is definitely good. Uh, I've got four weeks of data. And for some routes, that's just excellent. Like, for example... Let's look at Route 442. I always go to that one because it's at the tip of Manhattan and there's a ton of data for it. So as you can see, I've got lots and lots of data, days and days and days of decent data for this route. So I can trust the anomaly score a lot more in this case because it's seen so many days of traffic. Uh, so I know that like right here, when we, when we jumped, um, right here, when we jumped from... Uh, three miles per hour up to 30 miles per hour, and, and that was consistent over, you know, an hour almost. That's uh, something that's un unnatural for that time period, and, uh, and you can see the anomalous score go up because of it. Uh, okay, so I'm just trying to show you, like, ways you can investigate anomalies here. Uh, so this is one way, um, you, and there is yet another way you can do this, which is to browse the map over time. This takes a while to load. Uh, but what it'll do is it will plot all the maps and get all of the data for all the anomaly scores for the routes um, in the browser and give you a little time slider so you can move it back and forth and the colors of the routes will change over time. So let me turn the route markers off here and zoom in so we can see some of these colors change. If I'm looking for something in Manhattan or Queens or whatever, Let's see. So here's my slider up here. Right now, it is a three-hour period from 11.26 to 2.46 in the afternoon. I'm going to just scoot it over, and we can see some of those routes changing. Like there's, we got a red route over here. we got a red route down here. That means that uh, during that three-hour time period, those routes that are changing color had high anomaly scores. Um, so this is another way. There's there's some more down around the tip of Manhattan Sometime right before 6 a.m. Something's going on there. The thing is there's so much construction uh, around Manhattan um, What uh, you never know what's going on in some of these routes uh, So what I like to try and do is is correlate uh, Actual traffic incidents. So let's say I'm gonna look up uh, New York City traffic accidents and uh, one of the, let's see, NBC New York has like a live traffic map I'm going to look at. Let me turn the flows off and just turn incidents on. And you're going to see a ton of incidents here. And let's see if we can find a traffic accident that is close to somewhere we have data. Because, I mean, that's the important thing. If a tra traffic accident occurs all the time, but, you know, I don't have any routes over here. But here's one in the middle of Manhattan. Uh, 8th Avenue and 42nd Street. So let's take a look at 8th Avenue and 42nd Street. 72nd, 42nd, and uh, 8th Avenue is right around in here. So we probably not going to affect any of the routes going through the Lincoln Tunnel. This is happening in on the streets of Manhattan, not on any of these streets that we have traffic incidents for. But I do want to show you something because, uh, I mean, it's hard to find live uh, live traffic accidents and, and correlate them, but I, I was able to earlier 
uh, through this website. And I took a screenshot of it. Let me pop this up real quick. So here's what I found earlier. Um, this happened at 9, 11 a.m. this morning. It looks like there's lane block due to a stall truck on I-278 uh, eastbound at 2nd Avenue. So that was, let me go back to my view here. We want to go, this was at 9, what did I say? 9, 11, right? Uh, yeah, 9, 11 a.m. And where is this? This is down here, right? Yeah. Or was it right here? <clears throat> if I look at the, yeah, right here, which is right around in here, okay? I-278, I I uh, eastbound exit 23, which is 2nd Avenue. And that is 2nd Avenue exit 23 is right around in here somewhere. So there was some incident that was slowing down traffic here at nine something. And I want to see if there's any correlation with uh, the right. Uh, there is a there is a speed up. There is an uh, right there. This is eastbound. So what is this guy? Show this route marker. Uh, this is the right road eastbound. Let's look at the chart for this guy. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of data for him, but looking at today. So here's midnight, two, three, four, six, eight, nine. Look at that. Uh, right around 9-11, so this is where you can definitely see the traffic speed drop from 47 miles per hour pretty quickly down to around five miles per hour. And that was enough to cause an anomaly to go up through that whole time period. So that definitely looks like a correlation. I mean, if this is, if if eastbound 278 got blocked around here, uh, it would certainly potentially uh, affect this, this traffic route, the traffic flowing eastbound down 278 here. Um, so uh, I, you can catch incidents like this pretty easily. There, there's another website that I go to to, to uh, check these things. Well, there's a Twitter feed called 511NYC. Um, I can, I can do, sometimes do some correlations on, on these incidents, uh, but it's interesting to, to, do, to find this out because, um, I mean, a lot of times if you're sitting here trying to, trying to look through rush hour and figure out oh, what's going on here and you'll see, you know, a bunch of routes light up in one area. And if you dig into them and look at their data, it's obvious that there's like, major traffic slowdowns in several of those routes. So something is occurring in that geographic area that's affecting the traffic speed in those routes. And Nupik is saying there's anomalous activity in these routes, but I'm not able to associate it with any traffic incidents that are coming from, you know, the, the news or the Twitter feed or uh, these email alerts that I get from NYC DOT. But uh, something's definitely going on. I mean, you can manually see it and Nupik certainly sees it. Um, so uh, at this point, what I would really like is more data. Uh, if you're following along with this tutorial and you find some interesting traffic anomalies that you can associate with actual traffic incidents that uh, occurred in the New York City area, I would love to see those as well. So email the mailing list, take a couple screenshots um, and, uh, and let me know what you're finding. I think this is a really cool interesting application of, of HTM and anomaly detection, and it could be applied to a lot of different things. I mean, any type of scalar values changing over time, whether it's traffic speed, energy consumption, um, you know, water levels, uh, uh, weather conditions, uh, there's, are, are ripe for us to start generating anomaly scores for. So before I sign off here, uh, I feel like I should at least introduce you to some of the code um, especially in the JavaScript client <clears throat> that interfaces with HTM engine. Uh, so let me show you that real quick. Uh, here in node client under the lib directory, I've got uh, all of the code that inter interfaces with HTM engine in this HTM engine client class. Um, and all it really is is an HTTP uh, interface uh, because that's, um, that's what uh, the Python engine gives us. Um, so it has, you could easily like pick up this class and reuse it for whatever you wish. It has functions for posting data to a model, uh, 
creating a model um, given a min and max value and, and a unique identifier uh, and also getting data from a model. So uh, this could be easily reused. Uh, the last one is gets last updated. So this will give you the timestamp of the, the last updated value that HTM Engine has seen for that model, which is really useful uh, when you're deciding what future data to send it. Um, so uh, this uh, is totally reusable as a, as a client for HTM Engine. Um, the other classes in, in here, uh, most of this has to do with uh, the website itself. Um, the interesting thing is probably the traffic pusher. Uh, it's that this is the logic that decides uh, what data to query from the data service and push to HTM engine. And it's just handed an HTM engine client object and um, a data client object, uh, which is here. This traffic data client, it is the client for the Riverview data service. Um, and it knows how to get traffic data from that service. Uh, so the traffic pusher just gets two instances of those, those objects and uh, depends on them knowing how to fetch their own data. Uh, the, the primary logic in this traffic pusher is in a fetch method, um, if you want to get into exactly the details of it. But uh, if you want to reuse any of this, feel free. Um, uh, the HTM engine client is probably the most useful because that's where you'll interface with uh, the HTM engine. Um, but yeah, just a quick overview. Uh, I won't get into all the client side stuff. You know, I do a lot of charting with digraphs and uh, a lot of Google Maps stuff. If you want to dig into that, feel free, uh, figure it out. Um, PRs are welcome for this code base. If you find something that's wrong or can be improved, uh, feel free to create a PR. I'm happy to review it and accept it. I'm going to keep this tutorial out there in our new community code base so anybody can uh, play around with it. So, so uh, right, I, I hope you have enjoyed this, uh, this HTM engine tutorial with emphasis on how to do traffic anomaly investigations uh, with, with live New York City traffic. Uh, best wishes, and I will talk to you guys all on the mailing lists. Thank you.